To have used Linux in the late 90s was to be in a state of constant flux. Not because the crop of software available on Linux was ever changing, though it certainly was, but because developers of all stripes, much as they do today, had immense potential to create change, to disrupt what some were sure was an untapped market. And they tried, many, many times. The common desktop environment had been around since 1993, but only on Unix boxes until CDE was ported to Red Hat in 1997. Overall, time would not be kind to CDE nor would other Linux distributions as the original proprietary desktop was never properly ported to anything else in the Linux world. Not for lack of trying, but because proprietary software, especially desktops, had a hard time earning mindshare from the early Linux distro pioneers. The Adam Richters, Owen LeBlancs, Patrick Volkertings, and Ian Murdochs. This remains true today, with one exception. It was a Monday, one like many Mondays before it in 1996, except that this Monday, a new newsgroup post penned by Matthias Ettrick could be downloaded titled, New Project, Cool Desktop Environment, KDE. Programmers Wanted, it started. Unix popularity grows thanks to the free variants, mostly Linux. But still, a consistent, nice-looking free desktop environment is missing. And this was true. Most of the options that Linux users had were really window managers, unless you looked to the proprietary solutions like CDE and Looking Glass. And more than that, even defining what a graphical user interface even was in the open source world would prove to be difficult. But Matthias took the leap anyway. The idea is not to create a GUI for the complete Unix system or the system administrator. For that purpose, the Unix CLI with thousands of tools and scripting languages is much better. The idea is to create a GUI for an end user. Somebody who wants to browse the web with Linux, write some letters, and play some nice games. There was also a push to create a common look and feel to the entire thing leaving behind the hodgepodge of styles of CDE. At the time, this was unheard of in the open source world, at least as it pertains to getting code into a compiler. Of the toolkits and libraries out there, Matthias chose Troll Tech's Qt. They were a company solely focused on development of Qt, so they put up the money and developer time in managing and testing the widget libraries. And better still, it was portable to Windows. The downside, though, was one of licensing. At the time, it was free to run personally, and you even got the source code under the Cute Free Edition license. But on the other end was the Cute Commercial license. And because the Free Edition did not allow modifying Cute itself, most in the free software movement didn't want to touch it. In spite of this, KDE continued, but not after getting a little less cool. Matthias said in an interview with Linux Journal, Originally, we thought about giving the K a meaning other than KDE, but we gave up that idea before the first line of code was written. Much like XFCE ever so slightly before it, the K desktop environment would soon become a looser collection of pieces with the panel, file manager, terminal, and other bits being developed and released independently. Almost a year later, KDE development was in full swing, but efforts could be done much faster in person. So, a meeting of about 15 developers, dubbed KDE-1, was scheduled for August 15, 1997 in Arnsberg, Germany, where, among other things, internationalization and documentation was prioritized. And progress was made on the very first file manager in KDE, named KFM, or K-File Manager. With all that work behind them, the K desktop environment would see its first real beta release one year and six days after the inaugural announcement. It became clear quite quickly that KDE wasn't just some pet project. Even in the early stages, KDE was functional, fast, and came with almost everything one might need to get right to work. 
However, some wondered if the look and feel of the desktop wasn't lifted from other projects. Could you blame them? The icons and task tray and clock resembled Windows 95. The workspace switcher and launchers resembled CDE. And there were even some warp elements in there. However, in response, the core team wrote, KDE is not a CDE, Windows, or OS2 clone. While some ideas may have originated from those systems, KDE is unique, and we have no intentions of cloning another system. Later in 97, KDE EV was founded in Tübingen, Germany, the same city the desktop was announced in, to represent KDE financially and legally. After two more beta releases, one in November of 97 and another in February of 98, the proper release of KDE 1.0 was released to everyone on July 12th, 1998. The idea that the software should integrate and have a consistent look wasn't just an idea anymore. Parts of the KDE Office application suite, much of which was still in alpha, like KPresenter, were being shipped with KDE itself. It was a presentation software that had already been used live at the 5th International Linux Congress with great success. The next iteration of KDE, 1.1, was released in February of 99, improving KFM, which would soon become Conqueror. It also included a short-lived KMail 2 and introduced the iconic letter K on top of a gear. This icon, though changed a bit, is still in use today. But new additions and improvements didn't stop there. Later in April of 99, because KDE can't be outdone by Clippy, an animated mascot, Conky, named after the Conqueror browser, was announced. While not officially the KDE mascot yet, Conky was very popular and would overtake Kandolf, the original KDE mascot, soon enough. Though there were more releases of KDE 1.1, they were mostly bug fix releases, as earlier in 99, Qt had announced version 2.0. So efforts were focused on a port to it, which would eventually turn into KDE 2.0 to match. This also signaled a change within Qt, as they released Qt 2 under the Q public license. The biggest change here was that Qt licensing could never be more restrictive than the QPL itself. However, this was still not enough for the Free Software Foundation. KDE 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 were released later in the year, and shortly after, in December, 1.89, Crash, with a K, of course, was released to developers based on Qt 2.0. After the Y2K scare settled down, Five betas, 1.90 to 1.94, were released between May and September, with a 2.0 release candidate on October 10, 2000. The official 2.0 release came shortly after on the 23rd. And in this release, aside from the fact that most of the KDE code had been entirely rewritten for the new Qt, Conqueror officially replaced KFM, and the full K-Office suite made its debut. Conqueror did it all. Browse the web could handle all the user-facing file management on the system and show all the documents you threw at it. It stood tall against its competition, Internet Explorer and Netscape Communicator. KHTML, the engine at the heart of Conqueror, would eventually be used in projects like Apple's WebKit for use in Safari and Google's Blink for use in Chrome and Chromium. Conqueror truly is the grandfather of the modern web. As for the K-Office suite, K-Spread for spreadsheets, K-Illustrator for vector drawing, K-Word for word processing, K-Presenter for presentations, and K-Charts for diagrams were all included. All while maintaining the customizability that KDE has always been known for. KDE could be easily installed in Caldera, Debian, Mandrake, Red Hat, SUSE, and True64. Four months later in 2001, KDE 2.0 one is released with, and I'm guessing here, no Attune, a media player, and KDevelop, KDE's own development environment. Six months after that, KDE 
This release was able to make 50% gains in startup times for some applications and improved Conqueror, KHTML, and KJavaScript quite a bit. The final release of the KDE 2 series was on November 21st, 2001 with the 2.2.2 maintenance release. Katie, Conky's next door neighbor, girlfriend, little sister? It depends on who you ask, was announced along with a new group, KDE Women. The group was meant to foster inclusivity and bring more women into free software communities. In April of 2002, KDE 3.0 was released as a bit of a surprise to casual onlookers. No beta announcements here, but that didn't stop the team from developing a lockdown kiosk mode, KDE Print, which would be the front end for things like CUPS and LPR, which was accessible to all applications on KDE and brought the popular vCard compatibility to Kmail. It still looked a lot like KDE 2.2.2, but whispers of a new default window and icon theme were there if one cared to look. And at the beginning of 2003, KDE 3.1 debuted with Keramik, a new window theme, and Crystal, a new icon theme. These assets set the visual tone for KDE for the rest of the next few releases. Tabbed browsing was also introduced in Conqueror, as well as LDAP support for contact in Zine also made its debut as a multi-format media player plugin. KDE 3.2 followed in the next year and marked the fastest KDE ever up to that point. Lots of applications that are still being developed today are included, like Juke, a jukebox-style music player, and KWallet, a password and web data manager. Later in the year, in August, KDE 3.3 brought integrations between applications with Conqueror able to send IMs, Kmail able to view online users, and eventually just gobbling up Copete altogether. And Juke could now burn CDs with K3B. And just a few days later, the very first KDE Community World Summit 2004 named Academy was held, bringing together developers, power users, and the general public to get an idea of what happens behind the scenes and to influence the direction of KDE. At the end of 2004, in December, Andreas Mueller of Nopix, Chris Halls of OpenOffice, and Jonathan Riddell of KDE worked together to create Kubuntu, a new Ubuntu-blessed version using KDE instead of GNOME. In March, KDE 3.4 was released with a renewed focus on accessibility with a new text-to-speech system that supported the most popular K applications. Shortly after the release of KDE 3.4, and after four months of development work on April 8th, Kubuntu is officially born. And toward the end of the year, KDE 3.5 was released with Super Caramba, introducing the things we know today as widgets. Conqueror was, for a short time, one of the fastest and most feature-complete browsers on the market, outshining even Internet Explorer and Firefox. No wonder Apple wanted a piece of that action. There had been two additional meetings since KDE 1, aptly named KDE 2 in 99 and KDE 3 in 2000. But it had been a while since a developer meeting like those had happened, until the KDE 4 core meeting in 2006 where KDE devs gathered to hash out what KDE 4 was going to be. There were also other meetings like KDE 4 Multimedia for their respective focus. This would all come to a head at Academy's September 2006 hacking sessions to glue it all together. After a few months more of hacking, KDE 4 Alpha 1 saw the light of day on May 11, 2007. KDE 4 went through two alpha stages, four beta releases, and two release candidates throughout the year. But it wasn't until January 11, 2008 that KDE 4 was officially released to the world. It was the first stable release to replace Conqueror as the file manager with the solution we have today, Dolphin. Up until then, Conqueror had the reputation of being too complicated to use as a simple file manager. But like Internet Explorer and the File Explorer, Conqueror and Dolphin still shared an immense amount of code between them. 
and Ocular. The current document viewer in place today was introduced to replace KPDF and KGhost View. Finally, the style was changed again. Oxygen gave a visual refresh to everything. And the general look and feel may have been the most stable thing about 4.0. As it turns out, though, giving it the .0 version will get people to believe it's nice and ready, fresh out of the oven. However, the devs didn't actually intend it to be so. It was meant to be a slow migration from KDE 3.5 to KDE 4, when things were ready for each individual. Those that knew this were accepting of that fact, but those that didn't were quick to criticize. Linus Torvalds, in an interview with Computer World, said, I used to be a KDE user. I thought KDE 4.0 was such a disaster. I switched to GNOME. I hate the fact that my right button doesn't do what I want it to do. But the whole break everything model is painful for users and they can choose to use something else. I realized the reason for the 4.0 release, but I think they did it badly. They did so many changes, it was half a half-baked release. It may turn out to be the right decision in the end, and I will retry KDE, but I suspect I'm not the only person they lost. Aaron Sago, a KDE developer, had heard quite a few of these arguments before, so he addressed some, with one being, KDE 4.0 isn't what a business would do. He responded, By asking KDE to behave like a proprietary company, these people are asking KDE to abandon what has worked for us all these years. They are asking us to abandon our identity, to cease doing what resulted in the free software desktop going from non-existent in the mid-90s to parity in just over 10 years. Remembering that we started 15 years and multi-billions of dollars behind our competition, that's a pretty impressive success story. The development of KDE 3.5 continued on throughout 2008 with maintenance and bug fixes, and the last version, 3.5.10, was released in August. After that, it was full speed ahead on KDE 4. With the release of KDE 4.1 in July, some improvements were delivered, but not enough to win over those that felt like KDE 4 left them behind. About a year after the initial 4.0 release, KDE 4.2 is released. It was at this point that Aaron Sago gave his blessing for those still on 3.5 to make the switch to KDE 4. With thousands of bug fixes and improvements under its belt, it was true, too. Theming improvements, new plasma applets, multi-screen support, and even K-Runner getting lots of love and morphing more into what we know it, is, know it as today. It was a great release and really served to convince some to return to KDE again. A couple of months before 4.3 was to be released, KDE hit the 1 million commit milestone. It was a fix for Akonati, a personal information manager framework. And in August, KDE 4.3 was released and focused on polish, now that the big hurdles were behind them. More than 10,000 bugs were squashed and 2,000 feature requests were implemented. Policy Kit, Network Manager, and KRunner were at the forefront this time. Later in the 4.3 cycle, all of KDE, starting from 4.3.4, is a software compilation now, abbreviated as KDE SC. In February of 2010, KDE SC 4.4 was released with a new animation framework named Kinetic that came with Qt, making for nicer transitions between applications and workspaces. As a result of the perception of KDE 4 and 4.1, a fork of KDE 3.5 was eventually announced in April. It was named the Trinity Desktop Environment and released a maintenance release at 3.5.11 and continued development until the next major version, which was changed to version 14, to avoid confusion with KDE. Later in the year in August, KDE SC 4.5 was released, and as they each had their own team and personality, separate releases were announced for the platform 
application, and Plasma workspaces. WebKit was now integrated and will be worked on alongside KHTML. In the works since mid-2010, an official split from KOffice as a result of unresolved differences. On one side, you had KPresenter, Krita, Carbon, and Kexi. On the other, the KOffice name, but only KWord as software, headed up by Thomas Zander. Those differences led, eventually, to the ultimate demise of KOffice as it never made it past version 2.4. Though Caligra, the new group, took up what was left of the mantle and continued. In January of 2011, 4.6 was released with an all-new activities system which allowed anyone to group tasks together to speed up workflows. Dolphin got faceted browsing to make file searching easier, and the KDE platform slimmed down in preparation for a mobile device release. For 4.7 in July, Activities takes a bigger role in the desktop. And finally, the work started in 4.6 paid off with the release of Plasma Active for tablet devices. A mobile device should be more than a collection of applications. It should reflect who you are. Plasma Active infuses your tablet with the smarts to support what you are doing, when you are doing it, with the all-new touch base activities user experience. It really was the usual plasma, but with a huge focus on the activities workflow found on the desktop. In November, K desktop environment is just KDE now. KDE's identity has shifted from being simply a desktop environment to representing a global community that creates a remarkably rich body of free software targeted for use by people everywhere. KDE is no longer software created by people, but people who create software. KDE saw two releases in 2012, 4.8 and 4.9. Together, they brought adaptive power management to save on electricity and battery life, better file management, touch-friendly components, and lots of application and workspace improvements. In October, KDE put into words what the developers, community, and users already knew. They penned a manifesto that reaffirmed their commitment to open governance, free software, inclusivity, innovation, common ownership, and end-user focus. And finally. In December, a redesigned Conky mascot that's cuter than ever. 4.10, 4.11, and 4.12 were all released in 2013, focusing on performance, user experience, and stability. But in the middle of all that improvement, the way KDE released software changed. What was once a structured release of application, platform, and workspaces would now be broken apart as of 4.11. The idea was to allow users and developers to pick releases as it fit them best, rather than to force users to follow along with the development, as work on version 5 of Frameworks, version 2 of Workspaces, and application porting to Qt 5 had already begun to heat up. Workspaces, now known as Plasma, made its debut at the end of the year in a technology preview. A few months later, on July 15, 2014, KDE Plasma 5.0 was released to all as a stable update. For those that didn't want to wait, Neon 5 was available, an echo of what was to come. Plasma 5 focused on KRunner, customizable panel layouts with multiple desktops, a multi-line clipboard, and central media control not to mention the previously worked on activities and session management, all while sporting an entirely new theme and icon set, all dubbed Breeze, complete with dark mode. In August, KDE SC 4.14 was released and would be the last in the series, but didn't shy away from improvements. However, focus was squarely on Plasma 5 and Frameworks 5. After this last release, KDE quietly moved away from calling things software compilations 
because of the plasma framework and application split. 5.1 in October focused on porting over anything that was left out of the original release when moving over from Plasma in KDE 4. 5.2, 3, 4, and 5 were all released in 2015, bringing with them better Bluetooth support, a GTK 2 and 3 style configurator, initial and then improved Wayland support, and better power management. During the long list of releases, a wild Plasma Mobile appeared in July, replacing the previously released Plasma Active, and shifted slightly to phones as well as tablets, with the first prototype available for the Nexus 5, a notoriously tinkery device. Pine64 followed at the end of the year. Lesser known, but still important, Plasma Big Screen was announced as a smart TV ecosystem. In January of 2016, the first big announcement from KDE was KDE Neon. KDE Neon is the intersection of these needs using a stable Ubuntu long-term release as its core, packaging the hottest software fresh from the KDE community ovens. Compute knowing you have a solid foundation and enjoy the features you experience in the world's most customizable desktop. In the rest of 2016, 5.6, 7, and 8 were released with a focus on security, much more Wayland and a long-term support version in 5.8. Also in 5.8, phone integration with KDE Connect and better desktop searching in KRunner. On October 14th, KDE turned 20. There are only a couple of other desktops that can claim to have lived so long and to have had such a storied history. In the beginning of 2017, the first Slimbook, a laptop by a manufacturer of the same name, is announced as KDE Slimbook, and it ships with KDE Neon so customers always get the latest and greatest plasma. Later in the year, Plasma 5.9, 10, and 11 were all released with more of the usual, performance improvements and Wayland work, but also a system settings redesign and notification history was added. In 2018, the first release, 5.12, was an LTS that brought more of the same but in a long-term flavor. This was followed by 5.13 and 14 later in the year that introduced the Plasma browser integration so things like notifications and downloads could be monitored right from Plasma itself, something that other OSs have had for a while. They also brought a better First Connect multi-monitor dialog to help with the ease of setup. In 2019, 5.15, 16, and 17 were released with, you guessed it, Better Wayland support with a focus on NVIDIA and fractional scaling. But also, a Do Not Disturb feature, integrated WireGuard VPN support, log, login, and logout screen redesigns. In 2020, 5.18 marked another long-term support release followed by 5.19 and 20. Improvements continued as they always do. Better disk monitoring, a simplified system setting, better GTK app integration, and a global animation speed setting. On Wayland Island, support for screencasting, a shared clipboard, Windows thumbnails, and scrolling speed adjustments were added. In 2021, 5.21, 22, and 23 were all released with a new theme, the new Plasma System Monitor app, a firewall settings page, and power saving modes now show up in the panel to match work being done over on the GNOME side. Behind the scenes, but as a huge win, KDE Plasma is chosen for the Steam Deck when in desktop mode. This allows anyone to have full access to a real Linux desktop when they're not playing games. A real testament to the quality of the Plasma session. This year also marked more changes for KDE. They moved development and chat platforms to GitLab and Matrix. Another triplet of releases in 2022, 5.24 and LTS, 25 and 26 brought an overview manager to make desktop switching easier, a Breeze theme overhaul, fingerprint authentication support, trackpad gesture support, and better support for scaled X Wayland applications to remove blurry apps in most cases. 
In 2023, there was only one release, 5.27. It has a new welcome wizard, a new window tiling system, and Flatpak permission support in Discover to mimic what's available in FlatSeal. Work has already begun on the not-yet-released-as-of-now Plasma 6, which explains the lack of new versions. And if you're adventurous enough, you've been able to get a hold of Plasma 6 since November 8, 2023, with the first alpha. Beta 1 released on November 29th, and Beta 2 on December 20th. Plasma 6's release date is planned for February 28th of 2024. But we already have, on January 10th, 2024, the first release candidate. The developers warn it's not quite production ready, but it's time to look that direction. Bug reports are wanted as things are firming up for the official release. You can catch all the great topics and news stories as they unfold on our Lemmy subreddit or our news channel on Discord. You can catch all those at linuxuserspace.show slash lemmy reddit discord mastodon telegram matrix twitch twitter i don't know we've got more but you know you, you just plug that linux user space thing dot show right in the front and then whatever platform you're looking for and you'll probably find us I'm going to run out of uh, fingers eventually when we do that. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's jump on board, man, before I have to grow an 11th finger. And, and I have to bring the toes up to, to I know. compensate. And, and if you can't keep up with all of the things that I just said right there, check out the show notes because we'll have links to everything right there. 